This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Clueless Day Trading Frank. It's approximately 9.03 p.m. on August 18, 2019, Sunday evening, 9 p.m. We're waiting any minute now, um, in, in about 12 minutes or so. We should be hearing uh, on the yuan, Chinese yuan fix uh, against the U.S. dollar, which is a very important um, global macro uh, determinant these days uh, to see what the Chinese currency is being pegged against the U.S. dollar. All that has been explained in extensive detail in previous webinars. Welcome. This session will be recorded, uploaded to the Google YouTube channel for further viewing by all members, free trial subscribers, and anyone out there with the internet connection. Definitely spread the word around. It's a very, very strategic resource. The regular uh, bi-weekly forecast, strategic forecast on markets and certain individual stocks um, are um, very, very uh, useful uh, for all uh, members, traders, and anyone out there who like to learn a little bit about the realities of what financial markets do, specifically financial markets here in the United States of America. So, saying all that, full disclosure, this is purely for financial education, not for any solicitation or advice, and I shall begin. It's been a long week for all of us, um, for the world, for the global economy. Uh, as we already know, we have had prob uh, we probably, uh, in a scale, um, probably had one of the highest uh, volatile uh, range moves uh, on overall markets. I don't need to explain that. My real-time Twitter feed has documented and helped guide all my members uh, and traders to try to navigate the turbulence, the intense 800,000 point type of volatility up and down on a daily basis. And uh, certainly uh, feel free to review that to, under to get into the nitty gritty and the details uh, of how we survive and actually did quite well for the week, to be honest with you. We had multiple winners uh, in earnings, in, in, in uh, just to highlight some of the really big ones uh, that were big home runs, Walmart, Alibaba, NVIDIA, and individual reversal trades intraday that were ex extremely, hugely profitable on multiple, multiple stocks, including Apple, to highlight one of the big ones. So, saying all that, um, we have a very, very critical week that's coming in front of us. I am going to attempt, before we get into the technical charts, where I can show you some of the formations, what the forecasts are, where I think the markets can go, uh, and where, where and, and if things in, and if, or markets can go on both ends, up and down. Again, Technical analysis, fundamental analysis, all that is thrown out the window when we have huge global waves like tsunamis on the credit markets through the government, the 10 year government bond, the two year notes, the yield inversion, all that stuff. Those type of tsunamis, when they happen, they will rock the boat to a degree that no technical analyst on a very short term intraday basis or a multi day basis can figure out. You just have to accept that. We can certainly see patterns. I can certainly see patterns. I can show you pattern symmetry previous times. These type of things have happened and all that good stuff. But but the actual movement intraday, 15 minute, one hour, 30 minute, four hour, things like that um, are not something that anyone can predict. So what it does is that it plays with the emotional, it, play, it, it creates emotional havoc in human traders, the algos, don't always win because there are so many different styles of algorithmic high frequency trading programs uh, that are fighting each other for dominance or, or to scalp some intraday or or intra hour sometimes multi-day type of profits well they cannibalize each other and I was talking to an old friend of mine who is who writes code uh, these algorithmic high frequency trading programs uh, for uh, for uh, one of the largest investment banks in the world name that you'd be you all would be familiar with but i cannot disclose and i was talking had a quick chat with him over the weekend just say hello and he said you know what they're not even making money why because there are so many different styles of algos that are algo programs that are fighting each other so basically there's a black box battle and black box means the super fast computers black box battle that the war is not being won by any particular one type of 
uh, algos. So they're going up and down. They're moving with every tweet. They're trying to read the, and you know all that from my previous webinars, and, and, and I've been talking about these for years. You know it from the media, Jim Cramer and some of the other people talk about it all the time. So they're just moving back and forth, back and forth, and um, and obviously uh, they are literally moving on. The artificial intelligence programs read one word, delayed, or you know talks broke down, blah blah blah, whatever the case may be, and they just go nuts. So welcome, Mike. Uh, it's a beautiful summer's evening everywhere, and I'm sure people don't want to be sitting around at 9 p.m. Uh, to uh, to uh, uh, listen to the webinar, but they certainly can listen to it uh, prior to um, the market open tomorrow. Looks like the one fix is in as far, well, actually not in, it's in about six months, but Chinese futures have opened up 117 points in Chinese markets, so that's a good sign. Um, anyway, so the black box battle on the algorithmic high frequency trading moves, the markets, hundreds of points up and down, um, those type of things are something which are which are black swan events uh, day to day. And it's not something that one can, you can see the volatility here uh, from the top in the market back on the end of July to the bottom of the market. Well, short term reference bottom on the market around the 2775 level. That was on the 5th of August. So basically from the 5th of August, which was two Mondays ago, right? 5th of August was two Mondays ago. Uh, yes, it is. Just check the calendar on the other end. Um, that's, so 5th of August, for, so basically these two weeks, 10 trading days have been monumental, have been monumental. You can see the, in, in on visual terms, because this is all about looking at it on a visual level, we are tactical traders based on technical charts, so we are visual traders. So if you look at the volatility, it is certainly intense. However, a pattern can be detected. This is a one hour chart. This is the all time highs on the market. This is the short term lows on the market established on August 5th, which was two Mondays ago. And these are the 10 trading days that the market, it felt like the world was gonna change. That's how the media portrayed it. We, we kept our nerves and went through it every single day. We had multiple winners. We had some losers. We had to do a lot of trade management along the way. And those are things that you will have to get used to. We're not going to get 800,000 point type of moves every single day. That's for sure. But when volatility moves like that and the bond market trembles because of the yield inversion and many other things that have happened and the, and the constant U.S.-China trade wars with conflicting signals coming out of the U.S. Trump administration, even though I do believe they're talking, there were some very positive reports over the weekend that I put out there. Uh, there is optimism. They have always been talking, but what leaks out is what creates this type of havoc. So 10 days felt like the world was gonna melt uh, and nothing was gonna stay the same. But when you look at the overall picture, pretty much it is, it, it, it is um, uh, if, you, if you look at where I think the markets have a short-term top, around the 2950 level, we are right here at 2900 and the lower end is around 2800. Um, Bloomberg TV is on the back because that's the first source directly for the PBOC one fix. So once I get that, I'll mute that. So apologize for the little background noise. So if you look at it, um, we can see that this is a, um, this is a, a W type of formation, major resistance at 2925, 2950. So you're basically looking at anywhere from 150 to about 300 to 350 points in the Dow before we get slammed. Now, is the is the, is the, is the slam that uh, gets in here? Uh, I know I'm kind of like fast forwarding because I was gonna talk about this in a minute, but anyway, it's all relevant to what we're talking about. Um, from 2900 to 2950 is 50 handles multiplied by seven. You're looking at about a 350 point move on the Dow. Is it a guarantee that we're just gonna totally get slammed and then you know get back in that range again? Another 1000 point type of drop? back and forth, uh, 800 point type of drop back and forth? I don't know. That's the reason why we predict, but we don't sit around saying, oh, it has to happen that way. We are playing the probability game. 
that is how investing works. Whether it's in trading or investing, you're playing the odds of what might happen on the upside or the downside, and you're accordingly maintaining your positions, hopefully at a lower level. Uh, you don't want to have any heavy type of position. And even if you did, some of the things that went through the roof, obviously you'd be overjoyed. But saying all that, in this type of turbulent market, as we are starting to find a directional bet, in my opinion, we'll look at some longer term charts. You do not want to have any heavy position. If you need to close down positions, all positions, at the end of the day, do it. You gap market gaps open. Markets are up about 13 S&P handles right now. No guarantees what's going to happen tomorrow morning. Um, the fact is, it doesn't matter. You have cash on the side and you can certainly get into positions during the following day. So I'm not, I'm not advocating heavy duty day trading where you close out everything at the end of the day. But I will say when things get really volatile and you want to rem and remain somewhat, uh, uh, you, uh, keep your mental uh, state, your emotional state somewhat calm, certainly have a lot more cash on the sidelines than, than positions which are fully locked in with few little cash left on the side. So you can operate the next day that well in dollar cost averaging and such, which have, which have been tremendously profitable in these type of volatile markets. So it's pretty simple stuff. I've explained that many, many times. My advanced coaching students, the ACS students know that very well in their trade management sessions that we have done. And it's something that you learn from on yourself. Okay. Um, and uh, you have to know the, 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 the basic principles, but then you have to apply it and you have to learn how to do it. Speed is important. Uh, if you're an active trader, you certainly know that uh, you can make money. You can lose a lot of money on fast moving trades, but at the same time, uh, speed is extremely important. So that's, that's a picture. So just keep it simple. I'll get out of this chart. This was 10 days, 10 days. I'm going to put 10 D. This was August 5th. This was August, uh, uh, what did we close at? On August uh, 16th. So this was August, um, bear with me. August 16th, right? Mike, you can hear us, right? You can maybe type in if you're not, if you don't have a mic. Mike, are you connected? Okay, that's okay. You know, I'll just cover my points. So, um, so ten days. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm here. I stepped away for a moment. Oh, no problem, sir. And uh, you do have, uh, you can see the screen as I'm explaining things. Okay, sounds good. So, um, audience, view. yeah, everyone can see the screen. So, all right. So, bottom line is that um, uh, these ten days felt like the world was going to end. I know I keep repeating myself, but that's how it felt. Uh, but this is really what happened. Sharp moves down, massive. This was the 800 point down day. That rapid uh, 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 candle uh, breakdown. One second, enhance this a little bit. Oh, oh. Bear with me. One hour. Perfect. So um, remove drawings, get the crayon again. This was the big 800 point. As you can see here, this is one thing I want to point out, but don't want to get into it too much. If you see this extremely um, extreme mathematical formation of straight down candles, back and forth, trying to get up a little bit as it hits moving averages, but you can see a systematic distribution or systematic selling. This is pure large scale hedge fund selling. And this was propagated by the yield curve inversion and the massive selling that 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 happened that day. That's the day that the ten-year uh, government bond deal reached its lowest point, which I believe, if I look at my other screen, is a historical low, unprecedented historical low of one of uh, well, wow. Let me see here. I am looking at the wrong thing. A uh, historical low of 1.532 percent. Okay, so we are slightly above that right now. Let me see here, 52 week low year high, no, 1.47%. So this is the day that the 10 year government bond known as the TNX, which propagated a tsunami of selling both in the equity markets and in credit markets, 
and the constant talk about a massive recession looming with the yield curve inversion and the whole works. This was, and this is a day in history. Well, can it go lower than that? It sure can. Anything can happen. But I think this could be a short-term low that the markets can play out. And some of the biggest minds in the business have talked about that over the weekend. I was reading some uh, pretty uh, uh, in-depth articles on uh, this bond uh, yield inversion and bond curve and treasury curve inversion and stuff like that between the two-year and the 10-year. So um, it didn't stay inverted, just so you know. For the whole day, it's. I think it's. It went down to. I know it went down to 1.47 percent historical low on the 10-year bond. 1.47. Try to write that with that. And uh, and then it um, didn't stay there. It uh, turned around. So the inversion uh, with the two-year bond falling below the 10-year. Okay. And historically. The 10 years should always, you should get paid more to hold something for 10 years, right? Uh, historically, should always higher than that. Lasted probably an hour to two hours from what I understand. And then it turned. 10-year bond turned around. So it's no longer inverted below the two-year treasury note. So the inversion, as Peter Navarro said over the weekend on, on one of the financial channels, um, was more of a flat yield curve rather than a confirmed inversion. So big stuff going on okay so let's keep this simple so what is going to happen this week so let me draw in the economic calendar this is going to be a monumental week for the us and the and the global financial market i'm placing my bets the few pennies that we trade on the long side overall with some hedges that are going to be placed i had a hedge small hedge right in between all the long positions on uh, thursday didn't work on friday we zoomed up Right, saw that things happen. Right, you always have to have a hedge. Hedge is insurance. You put insurance money. You don't ask for it back from the insurance company every day. Right, every month. If your house, if your car doesn't get into an accident, your house doesn't catch on fire, you don't say, "Oh, give me back my insurance money." No, you keep on paying that small insurance. Good to have some VIX calls and some spy puts as insurance, just in case you get another massive 500 point drop for whatever reason. So that's why it's called a hedge or an insurance. I hope you all of you understand that. It's not a major position. It is a minor position against your long positions in order to protect yourself just in case. Just want to be clear about that. So these are the things. The one of the, uh, the, the it's a monumental week coming up because we have the Jackson Hole Federal Reserve meeting where Jackson Hole, all the way in Wyoming, absolutely gorgeous place out there in the mountains, right, uh, is um, going to hold the meeting of all the Federal Reserve meeting. This has nothing to do with the rate cut meeting or anything. This is where the Federal Reserve uh, uh, meets, uh, other leaders go. It's a big, big meeting of all these big central bankers primarily and some other business leaders and other people too. It's a bit like Davos. It's a bit like the G7 type of meeting, but far more critical. That happens, I believe, on Wednesday. You have, um, and I'm trying to look for it. I know it's on Wednesday, but it's not showing that here. Interesting. These are these are all global things. So I'm looking for the U.S. ones. Uh, U.S. Atlanta Fed thing here. I know it's Wednesday, so I'm going to stick to that. But there's a lot of other stuff that's coming up prior to that. But the most important critical thing here is Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And I will see it on my other side as I'm typing in. Frank, that's last week's calendar. Thank you so much for correcting that. I was wondering like, what's going on. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. You know, so I told you it was a long week. I do apologize for that. Thank you for correcting that, sir. All right, so we should be getting into the 18th. Are we into the 18th? Yeah, so we're good. Thank you so much, Mike. Big help. Um, all right, so let's see here. Wednesday, 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 Wednesday. I know we have US FOMC minutes. 
Jackson Hole, Jackson Hole, it doesn't say it here because it's not an economic thing. Maybe that's why it's not on the economic calendar. So let me just look that up. It's not like it's a economic report that's coming out. It's the Jackson Hole, Wyoming meeting. So that's why it's not on this particular calendar. One second. And on that day, you are going to hear from Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, who should, in my opinion, it's a Jackson Hole Economic Policy Symposium. That's what it's called. That's the reason why it's not here, because it's not an economic uh, in uh, number release type of thing. So Wednesday, it is uh, releasing its July meetings. And on Friday, kickoff. And on Friday, Powell will be speaking to kick off the Fed's annual Jackson Hole meeting. Okay, Friday. So Friday is the Jackson Hole stuff. So very, very important. There are multiple the, uh, governors who are going to be speaking you know, prior to that, but this is what the Jackson Hole meetings, as, as far as I can see here, will be kicking off uh, on Friday. Powell will be kicking off to kick off the Fed's annual Jackson Hole Economic Symposium. For some reason, I thought it was Friday, but uh, I'm sorry, it was Wednesday, but Wednesday, the reason why I thought that, so this is the Jackson Hole Symposium economic symposium where all the big shots are going to be there and the comments delivered by federal uh, fe federal uh, fed chairman jerome powell is going to be critical because he has to stand his ground and explain to the uh, us and the global markets that given everything that's happened given all the negative bond deals in europe and in asia in some cases and all the currency turbulence and the bond yield curve inversion that he's looking to cut rates going forward on a systematic basis. Not just say, oh, I'm just going to cut rates once and it's done. He must portray to the market. And I put that article out there. So please, everyone read it. He must portray to the markets. Indicate, signal to the markets on that Jackson Hole speech that he's going to give that he is open to a rate cutting cycle, not just a mid cycle adjustment, which simply meant one and done. One and done means you're gonna cut rates once and they'll see you later. No, because things have gotten a lot trickier, softer globally. And these bond market is signaling an imminent recession based on the of, of the of, of the inversion and all that stuff. Companies are starting to cut their estimates because of fear of this US trade China trade war going into next year. Lots of fear has crept in. That's the reason why the markets were behaving like the way they were behaving last week. So he must portray in simple terms, don't wanna keep on repeating this, that the rate cutting cycle, rate cut cycle has begun. Of course, they have to be data dependent, meaning like if the economy is showing very strong signs of inflation and all that stuff, which it hasn't, uh, and uh, and and uh, much more strength than people think, then they might have to pause. But he must. It's a very delicate balancing act, and I certainly assure you, none of us and no political leader, President Trump or anybody, wants to be in president in Fed Chairman Powell's shoes right now because he's trying to fend off attacks from the Trump, uh, not Trump administration, from President Trump personally on the fact that they you know that he doesn't know what he's doing and all that stuff, which I think is kind of silly. But hey. And, you know, that's what Donald does. Um, so rate cut that, the, uh, but he's in a very, very tricky position. He must must signal to the market that the rate cut cycle has begun. Okay. Has begun. And the markets will love it. And we're going to hit new highs. Now, the problem is that if he goes out and says, I'm going to cut rates like a monster, which means that things are really, really bad out there. So that again, you, you know, it's a very tricky situation because then the markets might look at it and say, okay, it sounds good that he's going to cut rates, but my God, they must know something we don't know. And markets might shoot up three, 400 points and then just keep crashing for the next three days. So all the scenarios will happen. So I will do, just so you know, multiple strategic webinars as we move along this week instead of waiting for the next Wednesday and the next Sunday. I'll probably do one tomorrow or on Tuesday. I'll do one on Wednesday for sure. Uh, and then we, I might even do one on Thursday or Friday. I want to keep people abreast. We want to make money, and I'm going to do my best to make sure that all of you guys are on the same boat. Now, why was Wednesday so important? Because that's when the Fed FOMC minutes from the last Federal Reserve meeting, which was very critical, 
which caused a big hiccup in the market. And then, and, and then Trump came in and said about the $10 billion extra profits. And that's it. Okay, see you later. And the markets then crash. Um, this FOMC minutes will show us what they actually, how many people were dissenters, how many governors were dissenters, Fed governors, and all that good stuff. So this is very, very important. We start off Monday with uh, retail sales. Very important number. We want retail sales to be strong. Last week, they were. And that was a great sign. Walmart, one of our big winners, was up a lot. Now, Walmart outsources significant amounts of my, uh, uh, goods uh, that they make in China, yet they are handling their profits and their numbers well. And they said nothing to be really that worried about. But they have, uh, they have switched a lot of their outsourcing or manufacturing uh, um, factories to Vietnam, um, to Cambodia, to Bangladesh, all those places. So they're doing well. And that's what the Trump administration is pushing. Move out of China and try to open up, you know, as your supply chain management in other parts of the world, which we are not in conflict with on the trade side, and you're going to be okay. And Walmart seems to be doing a great job. Great job. It's good for them. And U.S. companies are very adaptable. And, uh, and, and even in today's article that I put out there, please read. It says here clearly that one of the reasons that the Trump administration did that to allow U.S. companies to basically out, you know, change their manufacturing locations away from China, give them more time. Even very positive comments on Apple. Very positive comments on Apple when he met Tim Cook for dinner on, on Friday. I thought it was brilliant. And he said Apple needs to compete with Samsung, which I've always said, buy a frigging iPhone, dump your Samsungs or your Samsungs. And, um, and, and, and because Samsung makes everything in Korea, pretty much. And we make it globally. So the point is that Apple would be at a disadvantage and the president acknowledged that. That's big. Apple should be up nicely tomorrow morning. So saying all that, uh, so we have the retail sales. Uh, we have, uh, 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 it's not that important, the red book. Uh, mortgage applications, it's important. Health of the housing market, nothing that critical. Rates are at all-time lows right now. Refinancing and new home sales should start to spark up, uh, spark up absolutely. You know, with rates this low, you can get a 30-year mortgage. I don't know what the exact rate is right now, but I'm sure you can get it a heck of a lot cheaper than you could a month ago. So, or you can refi your mortgage, U.S. existing home sales, FOMC minutes, extremely important. We get into Thursday with jobless claims, important. PMI, very important, shows you the inflationary pressures, price pressures in the market on the, uh, on, on the U.S. economy from the uh, 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 production side, manufacturing side. Consumer confidence, very important. Oh, that's not ours, sorry. U.S. leading indicators, quite important. Natural gas report, don't care about. Kansas Fed City manufacturing index, important, not that important. Um, and then we get into new home sales again on Friday, and then most importantly, Jackson Hole. So that's the, that's, that's the roadmap on the economic side, what we can accept, expect, and those are gonna be the catalysts that move the market back and forth. Most important, this and this. That's all you need to know. Let's move on. Now, futures are up about 14 points right now. One second. I mean, the RMB fix is coming up now. One fix. Yep, Hong Kong Hang Seng Index back above 26,000. Now we've managed to clear that hurdle for now. 357 points. Be okay. They fixed it somewhere around 7.03. I'll give you the exact number in a minute, but the market seemed to like it. So that means they didn't fix it where it's too weak against the U.S. currency. It is somewhere in that seven range that the market is comfortable with. So it's a good thing. Okay, I'm going to mute that for a second. Now, let me explain to you guys a couple of quick things here. So, you know, let's talk about the positives, okay? We're always thinking about the negatives. You know, that's how the, our, 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 our brains are geared to always think about panic, fear, bunkers, diapers. You know, that's just the way, you know, life works, right? Good things in life are never really mentioned that well. Uh, it's always the bad things that that, that makes uh, all the news. It's always been like that. Human life, right? That's the way it is. So what are the positives? So number one, um, we have uh, uh, China uh, made a major structural adjustment to the interest rate policy. Nothing to do with the one internally, which was which is going to help them lower the borrowing costs for a lot of their companies and stuff. And that is a big positive. So that's a China stimulate. China basically stimulus. They are. Uh, Net net, they actually cut rates. And I think I put that article when I saw it as breaking news because these are very relevant for all my members and traders. I want them to be somewhat smart and educated as they're trading options and stocks and stuff. So this way they, they know what you know what is uh, pretty much going on. 
So China stimulus in a way that they actually technically cut rates, very positive. It happened over the weekend, Saturday morning. Number two, Hong Kong, which has been a flashpoint and uh, uh, is, is serious stuff uh, with uh, the protesters and uh, fear that China might send in the PLA, People's Liberation Army and all that stuff. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I don't think they'll do that. The, 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 it's starting to calm down. So Hong Kong is starting to calm down. Airports are open. The protests are being peaceful. Um, so Hong Kong coming down. Good thing. Because this Hong Kong flare-up also caused a lot of turbulence in the market. Let's not forget, Hong Kong is probably the second or third largest, uh, I would say third largest uh, financial center in the world. So it's like New York shutting down. How do you like that? You know, all protesters in New York and say, okay, it all see shut down. People can get to work. You know, the, what do you think the markets are going to do? So Hong Kong in a smaller way was the same thing. So Hong Kong is starting to come down. Earnings, S&P earnings overall, 75%, 76% of companies have beaten earnings very handily. Okay, so that's a very good sign. No sign of an imminent recession when it comes to an earnings recession. Don't forget that about a month or two ago, all they were talking about how bad earnings were going to be. Well, overall, companies have uh, delivered earnings pretty strong. And the ones which haven't have been hit. But overall, they've been good. So that's a, bit, that's a big positive going into the third quarter. Number four. We have U.S.-China trade talks, which seem to be uh, trade talks, which seem to be progressing quite well. We'd like to hear more positive things, but hey, so uh, that's a plus. The, the comments coming out this weekend from Peter Navarro, uh, from uh, um, uh, Larry Kudlow, even the President uh, Trump himself, uh, as he left my uh, hometown here, you know, not too far away, Bedminster, where he was at his golf course, been there, you know, uh, quite a few times. A lovely place, um, Bedminster, where he has, was, has his uh, golf course and he loves to come down there. Uh, before he was leaving, getting into presidential uh, 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 helicopters to get, head back home, um, he talked for about 40 minutes and um, overall said that, yeah, things are moving along and the same old story, that he's going to be tough on this and that. And there is some talk about extending and President Trump, and this is extremely important for tech stocks. For Micron, for AMD, for NVIDIA, for Apple, for semiconductors in general, Avago, you name it. Extension of sales to Huawei. President Trump mentioned that uh, there are, there are, there's talk that they're going to give them a 90-day extension to keep on buying chips and things, and we could sell them the basic uh, uh, components to keep the global telecommunications network running. Let's talk about that. Extension of sales to uh, uh, Huawei. Tr uh, President Trump mentioned that he will make a decision tomorrow. I consider it to be somewhat positive that it's still there and he didn't say that's it. We will never ever do business with Huawei, which is the world's largest 5G network company. This is huge. So they're not blocking them out. So I think that's a positive. Number six, I believe that Fed Chairman Powell is not going to crater the U.S. economy. It's my belief. Okay? Everyone has to have an opinion. Like that old saying with Dick Tracy, right? Said, a man without an opinion is no man. So you got to have an opinion, right or wrong. Got to stand your ground. And if facts change on the ground, you change your opinion. But you have to have an opinion. Nobody's ever neutral in life or in trading. Either they're bullish or they're bearish. Nobody's ever neutral. Just the way in human life, nobody says, nobody's completely even keel. Markets are either, markets are manic depressive animals. Either they are very excited, which I don't think anybody is, uh, to be honest with you. Either they're just shooting up hundreds of points, or 800 points down manic depressive. So either, uh, you know, they're on antidepressants or they're just feeling too good. They got a big buzz out of it, you know, a lot of nice drinks. So humans are like that too. So markets are like that. And you see that on a technical form in the markets, manic depressive, very manic, happy from a technical perspective, very sad. Everything's going to end. Okay. So Fed Chairman Powell, in my opinion, the Fed minutes on Wednesday, 
and his speech on Friday, which is the most critical one, I believe is going to be a positive. He laid the groundwork for a sustained rate cut move as needed to sustain the growth in the U.S. economy. And I have always believed that was his intention, and I believe that he will continue with that. That's it. Negatives? We already know the negatives. I, I don't need to repeat that. The negatives, number one, are what's happening in the bond markets. These negative yields, no good. Not in the U.S. yet, but worldwide, no good. Okay? Bond market turbulence. Remember, the bond market, they, uh, from what I remember, is seven times larger in size than the stock markets. It's like the stocks start like the iceberg on the top. And the, I, the, top, the top of the iceberg is nothing compared to what's at the bottom under the water. So that's the bond market. Okay? That's the stock market. That's why they always said on Wall Street, the stock guys are idiots compared to the credit bond guys which seem to know more, which the credit markets are very important because they do much more analysis. They're more sober. As stock guys, we are more aggressive. We're more speculative. We're like, you know, pick up the ball and run. And those guys are like, hey, let's sit back and try to see what goes on, right? Remember that. So the bond market turbulence is a negative. U.S.-China talks, you can spin it out and ask a bear and they say, hey, it's going nowhere. So U.S.-China talks are, uh, uh, if no improvement, is a negative. We need to hear that they're coming here or we're going there, that there was some good solid, you know, they had some meeting of mind somewhere. China's being extremely stubborn. We're being extremely forceful. And it has to, you know, it has to work out a little bit. That's what negotiations are all about. So U.S.-China talks, no improvement, uh, we need to hear good news. So I consider it to be a slight negative. Emotional, fear, across the board, not just human beings, but big institutional fund guys telling us the world is about to end. This emotional fear is, in my opinion, can be looked on as a positive because there's so much cash on the sidelines, but this fear is driving sell-offs lower when it starts to sell you just see it like bang 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 it is just giving it away and then the next day they're up a lot but hey this is not necessarily good when you have a lesser confidence and ceos have said u.s ceos have said that they are they are starting to lose some confidence in the outcome of the u.s china trade talks that's not good because they start cutting their forecast, see you later. We're going a lot lower. It's simple. I'm just explaining things very simple. Confidence are starting to fall a bit because they're worried. And these are CEOs. These are people who basically, you know, what's you know, really, what drives America? It's not political rhetoric. It's U.S. business. Let's face facts. Without U.S. business, America's nothing. Our GDP is nothing. We're no longer economic power. Then what? So these are considered to be negatives. This emotional factor in the market, I think it's a big negative. So much fear, so much fear. So, and the volatility, I consider this intense volatility. I forgot to mention this. It's intense volatility in the market, I think is a real negative because it completely, even for tactical bulls and stuff, they're just like, man, what is going on? Can't even put a trade through and wake up the next morning being slashed on it. So fund managers are sitting back. Okay? So this intense volat volatility causes lack of confidence. And one of the smartest things President Trump did was on Monday or Wednesday, Wednesday, I think, he spoke to all the big bank CEOs like JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, Bill Moynihan, or Bank of America. All these people who are very, very critical to the U.S. economic infrastructure talk to them. Say, what's going on? And they explain. They don't expect. They don't see a recession. They do it. You know, they, they this, this volatility said was a lot of it was an imported from overseas, which I've always said a lot of it is because a lot of global money is coming into the U.S. government treasury bond and sitting there and trying to earn one and a half percent. If they left it in their government bonds, they'd be earning. They'd be losing 0.6 percent. So why not leave it at one and a half percent? On the, in the U.S. government side. So this intense volatility uh, causes 
lack of confidence, both on the retail and the institution institutional side. But therein lies the opportunity. That's the way I look at it. So far, so good. Mike and Mike, um, we're clear on this basic stuff? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the feedback. So now let's take a look at the charts. Where I'm looking at it, let's just put it this way. It's very structural. And I think that's pretty much what's going to happen. Features are up about 13 and a half points. Overall, it's called a risk, not risk off, it's risk on, right? On a risk on day means that you're in risky assets, which is stocks. On a risk off day means you're in safe haven assets like bonds. So now it's a risk on situation globally as far as we can see so far. So if you if you look at this chart here, you have 2940 or thereabouts, 2945 right here on the top end. This is where we are. This is where we closed that on Friday. Bear with me. Friday, 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 we closed that, yep, right here at around 28.85 or thereabouts. So we closed here on Friday. It was a nice, nice move on Friday after the 800 point drop, bunch of turbulence, walked you all through it, told you guys to buy those spy calls and stuff like that, which was a terrific uh, trade, even for the day, the ones for next week, or even the tw ones for the 21st, which is Wednesday. Remember, you know, you can always stagger. You can buy the midweek calls or the spies, you can buy the, the Friday ones. Those things were up uh, close to 90% from 95 cents or a dollar up to a dollar 82. They closed at a buck 68. Obviously, they're higher as we open up tomorrow. So, not bad. 100% on a real turbulent day. Take it any day. Um, so, we have this and. Um, this is the range I'm looking at, 29.45 on the lower range, 28.20. So 28.20, it's 120 points, right? 120 points between here and here. This is the range, 120 points. Multiply 120 by roughly seven or eight. Let's take the higher factorial today, which is eight. That means one S&P points is eight Dow Jones points. You're talking about a 960 Dow Jones industrial points just in this trading range, 960. You wanna take the smaller factorial, which is seven, then you're looking at 840. So let's call it 900 points in total on the Dow Jones industrial average, just this range itself. That's a very wide range, guys, okay? Anything more than 300 points is a very wide range. Lower end of the scale remains around 2780. This is a very structured, clean chart. Short term before the meeting, before Wednesday's release of the beige book, not beige book, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, minutes of last uh, meeting, I believe the market gets up here. Okay. Now, there are other levels here, which I've shown on my other chart, 2960 and stuff. I think if the Fed chairman delivers what the market wants to hear, and I've explained this just a few minutes ago, a sustained policy of cutting rates, not just saying, okay, we're just going to cut rates once, we're going to sit, what happens? I say, no. We understand what's happening in the global economy, the massive slowdown in China, which, oh, by the way, I totally forgot to, forget, uh, forgot to mention because I'm an idiot. Um, the massive slowdown in the Chinese economy also sent shivers and the German economy, the GDP contracted for the first time in many years. So this global slowdown has to be acknowledged by the Federal Reserve Bank of America, which is the big daddy, okay? Once he acknowledges that and says, okay, he's ready to cut rates a bunch of times, the markets, in my opinion, can get back to his 3,000. And that is a lot of points. That means roughly about 800 more points from where we are right now to up here. Can happen. Once it gets towards those levels, it's going to be fast and furious. You can put money down. They're going to hit the sell button just the way things work. 
So I'm not even being that optimistic. I'm going to be staggering my trades, my spy calls, and my overall long positions in the market because the banks have been are, are now turning out to be real juicy buys because of how badly they got hit. We bought JP Morgan. We bought BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager. Uh, we bought BlackRock other day too. Um, so Friday, I asked you guys to buy BlackRock. $2.65 calls and stuff. You got to keep your options short term here, one week out, maybe maximum two weeks out. Not talking about the big swing trades, biotechs and stuff, knocking in general, because we don't know week to week what's going to happen. I want to be very clear about that, okay? So that's pretty much it, guys. That's the picture. We might open up here, around here tomorrow. Futures could be up um, 20 points. Then we're going to hit that big downtrend line. These markets follow these charts to a level of accuracy, which stuns me at times. And you guys have seen that many times. So just keep that in mind. And I'll be showing a bunch of them. I don't want to overwhelm people with too many charts. That's why I've slowed down the number of charts that I put out there. Just focus on the ones I put out there. Look at your own screens. Try to do the best that you can. Try to do a couple of earnings here and there. Big earnings week coming out that I'm going to cover in a minute. After we get through the charts, we have Home Depot. I asked you guys to buy a couple of Chinese companies going into Monday. We have Home Depot. We have uh, TJ Maxx. We have Toll Brothers, Home Builder. We have Lowe's. Big retail week, Target, and a couple of other uh, tech stocks here and there. Intuit, Splunk, things like that. So this again. Good chance to make some good money. Chinese stocks have been on fire lately. Alibaba included. JD.com. All these types of trades, that, uh, stocks that we trade. So, what do we look at next? What we look at next are some kind of tea leaf reading charts. And they are mixed signals. Here's the positive on the SPX 533. We call it the SPX 533 which has been a terrific leading indicator of what might happen. Turbulence in the market certainly has screwed it up here and there, but in general, works very well. So here's the positive. These histograms, despite this massive volatility in the market, these histograms are still shrinking. To me, that's a positive. Number two, the, Mac, the, the RSI is still trying to get up there towards the serious overbought level. That to me is a positive. So you've got one positive here. You've got the other positive here. You can see that stochastic got really oversold. Now it's starting to get back up here. That's a positive. What we do need to see are these two lines, the black and the red line. These are the full stochastics, percentage K and percentage D. We need it to turn because when they turn, you get those monster one, two days back, back rallies, big candles, right? So we had a small doji here, and you can see the next candle that formed on Friday. But we need this, need this line to turn. Once it turns, you can stay long for maybe one to three days max, depending on how fast they're moving. Because every single time they have turned, every single time they have turned, the market has rallied for a bunch of days before they sold off. Now, even on this particular chart, you can... If you squint your eye, you can pretty much see that it's a W formation that's building up, heading towards 2940, 2960 on the S&P 500, which I just showed you on the other chart. Let's take a look at the same picture on the weekly. The weekly chart is still pointing down. So this is a negative, okay? This is certainly a negative. This weekly chart is not showing anything that great. Now, does that mean that it's a one week what's going to happen? No, it's basically telling you what might happen over a longer term basis. So this has not yet. No pointers yet, unless we have two major big days and this candle expands up big time, right? These weekly charts need to turn. Otherwise, all these little rallies that we get on a 24 to 48 hour basis are sell. You buy the, buy the tactical dip, you sell because this hasn't turned. So this is a negative. The histograms have gone negative. That's a negative. 
So on the slightly longer term picture, we are starting, we don't have any signals of a sustained recovery yet. All this can change over this week. All this can change this week with Powell, with US China trade talk, with the Huawei extension so that we can still sell to the, the, oh, the largest tech, one of the largest tech companies in China. All this can change. This is a mixed signal. This is quite oversold. This was quite oversold in the May to June uh, uh, period, June 3rd. This is still oversold. We need to start to see it go like this. I'll keep you guys updated. Any questions on this? Good. Next one is your is our great trusty New York McClellan oscillator known as NIMO. The NIMO is actually giving us a slightly more bullish signal. The NIMO went to minus 79 during the horrific sell-off in the past week. Um, I have to always told you, you start to see these ugly numbers, minus 59, minus 65. I don't care what's happening in the front end. There will be a massive reflex bounce. That's exactly what happened. It went two days. This was back on, on the a week of the 5th of, of, of August. We went to minus 79. We went to minus 52 on that 800 point drop. And then the markets rallied. So now we're at nine, minus 9.39. Just looking at the pattern, it tells me that it gets really overbought somewhere around plus 21. That means we have two days, 24 to 48 hours for this rally to sustain itself before it sells again. This looks positive to me. I'll take that as a positive. This to me is a positive. If you squint your eyes or you're looking at a big screen, you're gonna see that these MACD histograms are positive. So the NIMO is giving us a better signal on the daily chart, meaning short term. Let's take the same look at it on a slightly longer term view, like we did with the SPX 533. This is also the McLaren oscillator, given the overbought oversold conditions, is giving us a slightly more better picture than what the SPX 533 weekly did just a few minutes ago, as I explained. I like this. There was a positive divergence here because the markets fell to the same levels, but this remained higher, made a higher low. The MACD, I considered this to be a positive. This full stochastics is still kind of dubious. It needs to, it's either going to crash towards 20, that means we're going to be down 600 points plus sometime this week at one point, or it's going to turn, which means you can keep money in play longer on the long side without having to wake up every morning and thinking the market's gonna crash. So this signal hasn't generated yet. These two look pretty okay. And that, and the RSI looks pretty okay because it got very oversold. RSI over 60, close to 70 is where the sell signals come in. So basically that's it. We got a bunch of earnings coming out. Play your calls, buy one call, two calls, run with the flows. There are oh, many, many, many stocks that I've shown, which just get up and run. We just get up and run. Whether they're Roku, whether they're Micron, whether they're NVIDIA, whether they are EW, Edwards Life Sciences, Biotechs are doing pretty good, actually. They're doing pretty good. Humana up six, seven dollars, take the profits, they pull back three, four, look at my charts when I'm putting them out, decide what you want to do. Next thing you know, they're up another four bucks. So fund managers are buying. And that's all I got to say. So guys, let's have a fantastic week. Get ready for severe volatility. Hopefully, we're on the same boat together. Not like last two weeks, guys. We don't need 800 point down days and up days. I don't care how oversold things are. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't do anything for the American psyche. Mom and pop is so, you know what, scared. That it's not even funny. They don't even look at the stock market. They're just like, what? A deal must happen between the US and China. Fed Chairman Powell must calm the markets by saying that he is going to be cutting rates on uh, it, that it's not just a one and done, that he's on a rate cutting cycle. And then you see. In the meantime, let's all be tactical traders, try to make some money. Just gotta do it. Nothing.
that the market does, we control. We are simply f some faster readers of the market. The roadmaps are in place and you know where we can fall, where we can rise, and these charts are golden. Even if I said no commentary, no trade loss, and just put these charts out there, I believe there's going to be, there would be a lot of people out there who would still pay a few bucks every month just to see these charts so they can plan and see what they need to do. So this is your 15-minute chart. Let me show you the one-hour one, which is a slightly uh, more of a swing version. You've seen these charts many, many, many times. People who are not tracking the Twitter feed, I have nothing to say. You want to just throw money just as a gambler into the market and just hope it's not going to work. This is what the charts are telling me. It's a pretty good looking chart if you want to look at it from the bullish end. It looks like a um, W formation that finds a major resistance at 2941, 2960. They're very easy on the eye, very clean. Will this happen? Yes, it will happen if Powell delivers. Powell, I'm going to write it down. It's a, still a question mark. We don't know if Powell delivers. I believe he's under intense political pressure, which the Fed supposedly is an independent institution, so he's not going to bow to every tweet and stuff that President Trump attacks him on. But I know he's going to. I know he's going to do the right thing. If he does anything stupid, see you later. The markets will be see you later, and he might be out of a job fast, which means the markets will fall more. All right, so if Powell delivers, we're going to hit the 3,000 mark. Otherwise, these are the tactical, this, these are the levels that we are coming into as we speak. This is unprecedented. Explain to you all the reasons why this happens. And quick flash crashes back and forth, these are standard procedure. If you're not here on the bottom end of the range, you will never get this 600 point type of rally. Have a great evening. Get a good night's rest. Thank God for everything. Let's start the day fresh. Let's have a great week. Good night, all.